Hello, hello, professionals. My name is Rico Aladdin, and I am the founder of Professional Lunch. Today, we have a very special guest in the studio, and I have Dr. David Cook, the president of <laughs> NDSU. Thank you so much, sir, for being hey, here today. I appreciate it. I'm <laughs> glad to be here. Wonderful, wonderful. Please walk me through your professional journey you that led you here as the 15th president of NDSU. Yeah, well, so my journey really begins, you know, coming out of high school. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up in Iowa, in Ames, Iowa. I moved across town to go to college okay. uh, to Iowa State University. And uh, my mom and dad did not go to college. So I'm a first generation college student. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really explore or look at a lot of options. I applied to one college and I, I got in, thank, thank goodness. And mm -hmm. So I studied uh, political communication or political science and speech communication. I had a double major and I thought I was going to go to uh, law school, mm -hmm. uh, but I met a faculty member on the way who was a mentor who really changed the direction of my, my career and my profession and my studies. Mm -hmm. I ended up going to the University of Kansas for political communication. And that was an interest early on. And then as I continued to study, I evolved more into having a real interest in organizational communication and, and international communication. For my dissertation, I lived in Shanghai, China, studied, uh, did some work for an engineering firm out of, out of Kansas City and uh, never looked back. And that's really that international cross-cultural uh, lens has been one that has informed my research mm -hmm in my career and my profession in many ways. And it's really kind of my, my passion even to this day. Mm -hmm. When I returned from Shanghai, I had been working at the University of Kansas Medical Center doing research as a graduate research assistant and uh, ended up taking a job there overseeing the Center for Telemedicine and Telehealth and spent 14 years there, was part of the leadership team there for quite a while and jumped and did a uh, American Council on Education Fellowship for one year at North Carolina Chapel Hill. I then ran a branch campus in Kansas City for a few years, and my last job at KU was uh, kind of the right-hand person uh, to the chancellor there overseeing public affairs and economic development, and NDSU came calling, and I answered <laughs> I answered the phone, and, and I haven't looked back. It's been a great ride. Wow, wonderful, wonderful. Um, you've been in this job for about a year or so, yes? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, describe to me, um, when you were starting this job, uh, you research NDSU, you research yep. your community. What was one surprising thing you learned in the community? Well, you know, um, being from the Midwest, I'm not surprised per se <laughs> about how I just kind of connect with and I really like Midwestern people, I think, in Iowa and Kansas and North Dakota mm -hmm. are, are very similar in that regard. Mm -hmm. But even still, you know, after our initial visits and thing, I always just kept saying, I love the people. The people are great faculty, staff, students, and, mm -hmm. and community members, and, and those who have a real passion for the institution. And so I think that's really what caught my attention. And my wife came with me. It was January <laughs> of last year, and it was minus 21. Mm -hmm. And uh, we came back. So there you go. But I think the people are the one thing that really got our attention more than anything else. Well, wow, wonderful. So was becoming a university president a goal that you had when you were in college? <laughs> Definitely not. OK. Um, I always loved the university life, and I thought, you know, somewhere along the line, being a college professor mm -hmm. uh, was of interest. Um, I started taking on more administrative responsibilities early in my career, and ultimately, when I was asked to do this American Council on Education Fellowship, that is a higher ed leadership fellowship where I studied how people did things at North Carolina Chapel Hill, but I really traveled the United States and had a few international trips in there, too, and I think coming out of that experience, that's when I started thinking, well, you know, maybe, maybe I might want to be a president. So, yes. yeah. so the reason why we have this show is to give less experienced professionals, early career professionals, a window into the life, the experience of more accomplished professionals such as yourself. Mm -hmm. So um, you mentioned that you were a third generation college student. Yes. So uh, how did you navigate your first few years in college as a yeah. first generation college student? Well, you know, I, I think I bumbled through it, to be okay. honest with you. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I, I tell this bad joke that they handed out a syllabus in my first class, and I didn't <laughs> know what that was. And it was very intimidating. Yeah. And um, I got through it. I kind of persevered. But, you know, it was bumpy. Mm -hmm. um, and that was hard. And then, um, but I got through it. And I just grinded through it, I think. And then I decided to go to graduate school. And it was 
sort of deja vu all over again. Mm -hmm. You know, you look around and you have these amazingly accomplished people who are great students, very well read, uh, very impressive. And I, that same feeling that I had as a freshman kind of came back around and eventually, you know, you start saying, okay, you look around and you, you gain that confidence. Mm -hmm. uh, some people probably gain it sooner. It took me a while, um, but I eventually got there. Uh, but I, I will just tell you, uh, for me, that's why it's one of my passions as a president and, and as a leader is to say, I kind of know what that feels like. And I want to make sure that first generation uh, students are successful because it's hard. I probably got a little lucky. Mm -hmm. I had some good people, good mentors, good people around me who helped. And, and candidly, I just moved across town. Mm -hmm. Some people are first generation college students move a lot further than that. Yeah. Uh, but a real passion of mine is them. And of course, you know, working with students of color and Pell eligible students, these are the areas where we need a lot of help at this institution. And, and, and it's a real priority for me to, to be there for them to help them be successful. Yes, yo, you touch on something that is very important. And that's one of the things that I want professional lunch to be about, or to, to help those students who may who are struggling, who may be mm -hmm. struggling to figure it out, to figure things out at the beginning of their careers, to give them a pathway to success. So now that you are the president of such a big university, yeah. what is the role of a president at <laughs> such a big university? Well, you know, a couple of things. Mm -hmm. I'd say, uh, you know, number one, I think setting the vision and the yes. course for the institution, thinking about where you're at and what all your strengths are and where all the opportunities are and candidly where the weaknesses are, but really thinking about where you need to be and where you need to go. Uh, and there's a lot that goes into that. For me, it's a lot of listening. Uh, I spent two weeks running around North Dakota, meeting people, understanding what a land grant university really means uh, for this state and what they're looking for from the president. And I thought that was very helpful and very meaningful. Uh, and then I got back to, to campus and I kind of did the same thing again. I've been really trying to meet with every single unit, all the colleges, really getting a sense from everybody what direction we need to go. Mm -hmm. And so that's all part of how you build that, that vision. And you know the rest of it, it just starts to fall into place for me. You gotta have a, the smart, talented people around you to help you lead and help you achieve that vision. I always joke that I want the IQ of the room to drop when I walk in the room. <laughs> I've been pretty successful at that, you know, so, but uh, I think that, you know, in, in, in continuing to listen, continuing to learn, uh, continuing to recognize that, that, you know, it's a process. Yeah. The vision is a process and you're never really going to get there, but you just want to keep getting better. And that's what I'm trying to do here. Well, wow, wonderful, wonderful. So describe for me <clears throat> the chain of command of a university this, a university this size. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, um, there's a lot that goes into it, mm -hmm. uh, you know, near and dear to my heart. And I think any institution of higher education, shared governance is going to be critical. So you, you want to listen to, to faculty and, you know, they're the heart and soul of, of, of this institution uh, in, in many ways and getting a good sense from them where they want to go, where their strengths are, what mean, what makes a difference here. And so that's got to be right up front when you think about governance and leadership and decision making that has to be really important. Uh, you got to listen to the student voice, which mm -hmm. is also equally important. So I'm walking into an institution with a very proud and very successful and effective student governance and student governance history. Uh, the president and vice president sit on my cabinet mm -hmm. and they provide input. I can interact with them quite often. And so that's going to be critical, <clears throat> but it, it's the same, you know, faculty, student, and then staff governance has to play an equally really critical role. And so it's challenging, lots of different opinions and viewpoints. Uh, but then what also comes into play is what, what are the workforce needs of the state? You know, what does North Dakota need from NDSU and how can we achieve that? So you want to talk to business leaders, community leaders. You want to be a good partner with the other, you know, there are 11 colleges in the state. Many of those are community colleges. How do we work together to maximize our strengths? So that's critical. And then, you know, probably... Uh, the last group worth mentioning, a, a key stakeholder are your alumni and your donors mm -hmm. who care deeply about the institution. And I can tell you that you're not going to find alumni and donors who care more about their institution than the bison who give back and uh, to NDSU. And so hearing their advice and feedback where you got to go. So you take all of that and you kind of figure <laughs> it out and uh, yes. hopefully you get more right than wrong and you, and you lead the institution forward. Well, I guess this is um, uh, really a question that I've been dying to ask. <laughs> okay, this I'm nervous <laughs> now. Yeah. Describe a typical day as mm. a president. <laughs> yeah. 
you know, you know, it's it's uh, I, I I I say this a little jokingly, but not. I mean, it's a twenty four seven hour job. You know, you're wow. working all the time, mm -hmm. and you gotta love it. And I do. Mm -hmm. And and you know, it's just not me. It's my wife, mm -hmm. and it affects your wife and kids and family yeah. in all kinds of different ways. And so, mm -hmm. uh, the institution. Uh, puts a tremendous amount of uh, of importance and value mm -hmm. uh, and demands on the president. You gotta you gotta be willing to do that. I mean, and so this is what you sign up for. Yeah. And, and I'm going to tell you, I love it. Mm -hmm. uh, but but a, a, a typical day. I mean, you know, maybe there isn't a typical day <laughs> other than they start early and they end late. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. And on any given day, you'll you'll get a curveball mm -hmm. uh, that you didn't see coming. Uh, and, and they're filled with lots of great things, but lots of real challenges. Mm -hmm. and, and I love that. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, uh, the typical day is, you know, we're in the legislative session. Yes. And so depending, you know, we're, we're getting near the end. We're going toward conference committee. And I will say uh, the legislature has been very good to higher education, very good to NDSU. And I've been very grateful. Our, our main budget on the budget side uh, went through the House E and E committee. They were very good to us. We shifted over to the the Senate side, and a lot of great leaders there who listen and who care about higher education. And now we're getting into conference committee. So on the budget side, uh, for sure, uh, still a lot of work to do. So mm -hmm. knock on wood. But uh, you know, my days have been filled quite a bit with thinking about how to lead and how to build relationships and understand that you know, again, we're one of. Uh, 11 institutions in the state. We play a critical role and we need to be uh, responsive to the legislative needs. And, mm -hmm. and uh, they have very high expectations, but they also uh, care deeply about us too. And so I've really appreciated that. So mm -hmm. the typical day right now, that's probably the one thing that would be <laughs> different than, than other times of the year, but that's been taking a lot of my time these days. Mm -hmm. Right. Before we take a break, I want you to circle back on what you said about Landgren University. Can you kind of elaborate mm -hmm. for the professional lunch audience on what that is? Sure. And, yeah. Yes. So, you know, uh, you know, the land grant idea mm -hmm. and, and there's different types of land grant. We are an 1862 land grant. This mm -hmm. is an idea that President Lincoln, you know, had that was born out thinking back just even at the time of the Civil War where, you know, at that time, it was really kind of more of the elite or the privileged uh, that had access to, to, to education, period, and especially higher education. And they had this idea that, you know, we really needed to figure out how to provide access to education to the masses. And this is an idea that would launch and elevate and, and uh, advance, mm -hmm. you know, our, our great nation. Yeah. And so we have land grants across in, in lots of different kinds. But again, as the 1862 land grant, you know, this is one of the ideas that is part of our founding here, which I love. It's about first and foremost, access to education. How can we help provide access? And that can mean a lot of different things. It can be about geography. Mm -hmm. It can be about diversity. Uh, it can be about how do you connect your education to the needs of the state? And, and uh, it's something that I take very seriously. And so when I was traveling the state, there's some things that are, you know, quite obvious. You know, we have extension offices in every county. We have research extension centers out across the state that care deeply about agriculture, <laughs> uh, care deeply about energy, care deeply about workforce. Uh, and NDSU plays a very critical and leadership role there and complements the other colleges in the state, which is, which is very critical. And so that is uh, something that I think is absolutely critical and important, and I'm very proud uh, to play a role in advancing that mission. Wonderful, wonderful. On that note, we're going to take a short break here. When we come back, we'll talk to the president about some of the things that he loved about his job. We'll be right back. We are back. We are at the Bison Information Network studio at NDSU. My guest today is President David Cook. Welcome back. <laughs> you bet. Yeah. All right. So now we're going to talk about some of the things you love about your job. Okay. All right. So what do you love the most about your job? Oh, uh, probably the students. Okay. Um, you know, my wife and I are really dedicated to, to making sure that we're connecting with them, listening, hearing, you know, kind of what, what their experience has been. And so... This can mean all kinds of different things. So we we eat in the dining halls a couple days a week. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we love going to the various performances, music, theater. Obviously, athletics plays a huge key role. 
had a lot of fun with agriculture and little I and so on, and just, you know, get involved with student government and all the rest. So, uh, you know, it keeps you young, keeps you on your toes. Uh, and they uh, have a real passion for the for the institution. It's fun to to learn and see what NDSU means to them and through their eyes. And, and we're trying to learn from them. And that's probably my favorite part about being president. Wow, wonderful, wonderful. Tell me about what are the three most uh, successful professional successes that you have in your career? Oh, my, uh, in my time at NDSU or just uh, overall? Yeah, overall. Overall, yes. boy. <laughs> you know, it's a funny question because in any time, if you, you know, anybody, if you had any success, mm -hmm. you know, for me, it's because you put a great team around you. Mm -hmm. And so I would tell you that, uh, you know, across the span of my career, I think when I've done things well, it's, but it's when I've gotten a really great team around me mm -hmm. and that's really important. And that, you know, would be my advice is, uh, I crack this joke a lot, but make that IQ drop when you walk in the room, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's because you have great people around you, advising you, making you better. You can't be all things to all people. Mm -hmm. And so I would just say in general, overall, with, with the things that I've done from a leadership perspective, I'm very proud of that. Very proud that I've been able to, to build strong teams and, and get good, smart people around me who have made me better. Mm -hmm. And so that's a critical part of my leadership. Uh, you know, one thing now my wife would disagree, but I think uh, <laughs> something I've done here, that uh -huh. I've done throughout my career is sincerely try to listen mm -hmm. uh, and continue to listen. And uh, you think you have ideas and you think you're right. And constantly, even in my role here, I had ideas about what I thought made the most sense. And then you surround yourself with smart, talented people. You, you bring in as much feedback as possible. And those ideas just continue to get better. And so I think just the the commitment and passion to to engaging and trying to be honest and direct with people and transparent in the process. And mm -hmm. so I think listening is another part of my leadership style that I take a lot of pride in mm -hmm. uh, that I think is important. And, and I would tell you, you asked for three. I, I would tell you the the next thing is the, the best is yet to come. Mm -hmm. I'm very excited about what we're doing here. It's really hard. We're doing really hard things and I have a lot of respect for for the leaders here that are taking on tough challenges. Mm -hmm. We're in a tough environment, um, but I'm excited about where we're at, mm -hmm. but I'm really excited about where we're going. Mm -hmm. And I'm excited about the courage uh, that people have, uh, the trust that they have, uh, and the vision that they all have in helping me collectively bi build that. And so, you know, check back with me in a year or two and I'll give you what the third You one got is. it, so, I will. There you go. So you mentioned good team, you great team, and I, I like what you said about your team because I'm always curious for professionals who acknowledge those around them, yep. you know. And so my next question to that is, how do you build a great team? What are your strategies to build a great team? Yeah, you know, um, there are a lot of different ways to go about it, I suppose. Mm -hmm. I think part of it for me is understanding and recognizing my weaknesses and figuring out how to complement those. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm going to need people around me who are very detail-oriented, uh, I can be, but not day in and day out. Yes. So uh, I need people around me who, who are going to be willing to talk, tell truth to power. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they can't acquiesce or back down. They need to continue, even if they're telling me something I don't want to hear. So they have to have a backbone. They have to have confidence. Uh, so that's going to be critical. And I certainly have a number of people at, at NDSU who are willing to, to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, there is technical expertise that you're going to need in building a team. And so no matter what your leadership position is, there's going to be all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, verticals that are critical. And so some of those in a presidency are going to be around finance, as an example, or mm -hmm. facilities or administration or academic affairs or communication marketing. Uh, you know, these are different areas, research that you can't, it, you know, I suppose those unicorns are out there that are great at everything. I'm not one of those. <laughs> I know that I need to get people who have expert knowledge and expertise in all of those areas. Count on them uh, to give me feedback. You know, so this is in fundraising and in athletics, isn't it? You know, we have, we're, we're amazing in those spaces as well as the others that I mentioned. And getting great, smart, key, talented people in those, uh, you know, maybe talking vision with them a little bit, but uh, putting a lot of trust in them and seeking their advice, challenging them, but expecting them to challenge me and getting out of their way a little bit. And so getting together a key team with the right technical expertise is critical. 
Well, you mentioned uh, Tim, um, <coughs> and um, I have to circle back on one thing you said again earlier uh, about listening, mm -hmm. right? Every time I talk to a professional, they give me a different definition of listening. So, yep. so yeah. it seems to me that you mastered the skill. So tell me about your strategy. What is? How did you? How do you uh, uh, master the skill? How did you do that? Well, you know, I don't. I don't know if I've I've mastered it. I just <laughs> know it's something that I always want to keep mm -hmm. front and center, and it's something I value and I think is important. Mm -hmm. uh, so for me, it, it's in the actions and the behaviors you, you you do as much as anything. It's so again. When I first started, I thought it was important for me to understand North Dakota. Mm -hmm. So I spent time going out to communities and listening and talking with people mm -hmm. uh, and trying very hard to talk less mm -hmm. and hear what they have to say. Uh, and so, uh, and part of that, I think, is after they speak, kind of clarifying, this is what I think you're saying. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And having a dialogue that way. That's what I did across the state. But even internally, when I came back to NDSU uh, last August, getting out to every single unit, not having them come to my office, but I go to their their unit to talk with them, but to, to really put them to say, this is your time and your moment. I want to hear what you're struggling with and mm -hmm. what you think I should do and what the vision is. And so that's critical, but we have some other mechanisms. I have a leadership assembly that is a nice slice of of the campus that I meet with monthly where I get up in front of them and take questions and talk about ideas. But hope they'll challenge me and expect them to take ideas back to the campus. And I have the share your ideas link on my, on my website as well, which is another way of listening, getting feedback and, you know, always giving people a response, all the governance groups, the same thing. I'm meeting with them today, mm -hmm. later today, uh, giving them the opportunity to, to have an open dialogue. Now they may not like my decisions. <laughs> they may not like me. I don't know, but I, I hope they at least know that they've been heard. Okay. And that's very important to me. Wonderful, wonderful. We're going to take another short break here. When we come back, we'll talk to the president about some of the challenges that he faces in, in his line of work. We'll be right back. We are back. We are at the Buzz and Information Network studios today. My guest is NDSU President Dr. David Cook. Now we're going to talk about some of the challenges that you face in your line of work. Okay. Uh, what are the two biggest challenges that you face in your line of work? Yeah, you know, I'm, the biggest challenges, I would tell you, I, I really think of them as opportunities mm -hmm. as much as challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, we're, we're in the middle of the legislative session, so we have amazing opportunity to tell our story. Uh, we have a legislature that I would tell you cares about higher education and cares about supporting us, but they have high expectations, so mm -hmm. they ask tough questions. Uh, they want to know what, you know, what we're doing to make a difference in the state, and so yeah, while well, you mentioned that as a challenge, I think it's a grand opportunity for us to to tell our story, to help them appreciate, you know, what we're doing to make North Dakota the upper Midwest and really putting ourselves on the map, you know, nationally and even internationally is critical. So, you know, that's a challenge, but it, but it's really kind of an exciting uh, opportunity for us to, to tell our story, to make a difference in the state. And uh, we're not done yet, but I I think it's been a great conversation, a great dialogue and discussion so far, and I, I've really appreciated the process. Mm -hmm. And so that's been that's certainly been very good. Uh, maybe the the second challenge, but also grand opportunity, I would say, is you know I've come in and, and set a vision and outlined some key priorities for the institution, and uh, these are grand opportunities to really elevate this institution and take us. I think to a different level in the next five or 10 years, but you know, part of that are setting priorities. And so I don't, don't think it's any secret that, you know, of these priorities, it's talking about enrollment and retention and student success. We have to care about the student experience. We have to see them uh, be more successful and, and retain. And, and, uh, and so that's, uh, you know, priority number one for us uh, being a research one Carnegie classified research one, institution is the second priority out of that I've set out there and that's that's a grand opportunity and very challenging. We're an elite group and we're a smaller institution in the upper Midwest. We are among, you know, kind of rarefied air of other institutions that do that and so it's a challenge but an opportunity and it's an exciting one and so we that we got to make sure that we continue to move forward in that space. Mm -hmm. A huge challenge on our campus is well-being. And that's the other area for students, staff, and faculty. We have to invest in our people. 
We have to make sure that they know that we care. We have to give them the resources they need to be successful. And it's it's hard for a lot of reasons. Things are changing and our students are changing and we have to meet them where they are, but we have to care about our staff in that way too. Mm -hmm. And that's why I made that the third priority. Uh, the fourth priority uh, is diversity, inclusion, and, and um, uh, respect. So DIR, which are really important to me and, and that's, uh, one of the reasons, candidly, why I wanted to come to NDSU is I saw that as a top priority in the strategic plan. Retention, we talked about that a little bit. Our first generation students of color and Pell eligible students are struggling more than the rest of our students. That's a diversity issue. It's an inclusion issue. It's a respect issue. It's a belonging issue. We got to do better by them as an institution. Uh, and so, uh, we have to make sure that this is a priority moving forward for everybody as we create a community. And so that's a, a challenge, but a grand opportunity and one I'm excited about. And mm -hmm. then the last area, the, the fifth one was land grant. We've talked about that yes, a little bit. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll leave that one alone. <laughs> yes. But I think the, uh, the strategic plan and those priorities tee up you know, our challenges and opportunities pretty well. Wow, wonderful. You mentioned two things that I think that I can, I want to circle back on is student retention mm -hmm. and also diversity. I am really big on diversity. Mm -hmm. I, because, as I'm, because I get to meet people who are doing the best they can to improve diversity. Yeah, yeah so what do you, how do you define diversity? Well, you know, um, you know, there's different people. In, in fact, we talk a lot about the language. And mm -hmm. so, you know, let me answer it in this way and maybe a, a little bit different way. Mm -hmm. You know, I find diversity, you know, celebrating all of our diverse differences, inclusion, really thinking about how we can all become included. Mm -hmm. uh, equity is another term that gets used a lot in terms yeah. of how can we all feel equal. Mm -hmm. uh, respect, you know, here in our, in our strategic plan is how we, you know, note those differences and respect those. And, and ultimately belonging is another term that I, I think about a lot is it's just so critical that we make people feel included in belonging mm -hmm. uh, and, and like they belong in a community that we, we prioritize. Mm -hmm. uh, all of those things are interesting and useful and important and I value them. We get mm -hmm. caught up on words sometimes like diversity. It, mm -hmm. it frustrates me a little bit because sometimes it's a tough thing to talk about. Yes. And having a tough thing to talk about is hard and good, mm -hmm. um, but I also want to figure out how we talk about things, you know, moving forward. So I even think about access. Mm -hmm. So diversity for me in this state sometimes is about access to education, access to resources, access to knowledge, access to research. What can we do to provide our community access to the critical things that makes this institution great? And so, you know, that's kind of where I want to push us mm -hmm. uh, in, in a lot of different ways. But the important thing is that we're getting together, that we're talking about these things, and we're saying it's important, and we're going to get better uh, because we're saying that this is something we value deeply. Wonderful. You know, I really like the way you define it. You know, it's about giving access to those resources yeah. so that everyone can equally, equally get have access to yep. them. So very good. I really like that. Thank you. Uh, in so... Uh, you mentioned student retention. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a couple of things, maybe three things that you are doing when it comes to student retention? Yeah, so, um, you know, retention, again, is one of these areas where we, we have, you know, it can be defined in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, but just one kind of simple, straightforward way is we have a number of students that start here in August and mm -hmm. then they proceed through the year and then we want them to come back, of course, the mm -hmm. following August. And yes. so, you know, you're never going to have 100% of them come back, but, uh, you know, we have historically been around 80% and we've been dropping below that. I want to do better. So it's a metric. I want to do better. I want to get back to 80% and then I want to do better than 80%. You know, candidly, we want students who came here in August, who we know that they wanted to be bison and be successful, to want to come back uh, to be successful uh, moving forward as well. And so there are different ways to do that, I think, investing in that first year experience and beyond, mm -hmm. making sure that students, again, feel welcome, feel mm -hmm. included, that they're part of a community, that they're enjoying the experience, that they're appreciating uh, the classroom experience and the classes that they're taking and the learning that's taking place. So investing in the first year mm -hmm. is really critical and thinking a little differently about that is what we're going to do. Let's make it exciting and fun and entrepreneurial mm -hmm. and curious yes. uh, for our students. So, so I'd say that's one of the ways that you can do that. Uh, another thing that we are investing in is professional advising. Mm -hmm. And so, um, 
This is not a new concept. I'm actually quite familiar with it at other institutions that I've been at and or studied. <laughs> but let's get advisors in the first and even the second year that are dedicated to student success, helping them understand the curriculum, helping them understand the classes that they're taking, mm -hmm. uh, helping them understand the social emotional challenges that they might be facing, mm -hmm. helping them be, you know, somebody there that's helping with their success is critical and advising and professional advising is a, a proven model uh, that works there. So we're pushing that out uh, across, uh, across the uh, first and second year for this next year that will be critical. And then, you know, candidly, another thing that I'm really excited about that speaks to retention and diversity is uh, we're reinvesting and relaunching our Bison Bridge program. Uh, so this is a program that really targets, you know, diverse students. We want them to be here. Uh, and uh, when they, we, we bring them in a little early, we help them get acclimated a little bit. We connect them with uh, resources early on. We connect them with mentors that look like them or have a similar background as they do or mm -hmm. have experiences that might be similar. And they help mentor them through the first year, but also just connect them and wrap them around with resources. So again, we let these students be successful because mm -hmm. we value that. So we're investing in it. And so first year experience, <laughs> Bison Bridge and professional advising are a few of the things that we're doing to make a difference there. Very good, very good. So what was the hardest thing you had to change when you first started as president? Oh, uh, <laughs> the hardest thing I had to change? That's a great question. Oh, you know, I think I wear, you know, winter coats a little bit more. That's a, and that is true and that's fun. Um, mm -hmm. you, you know, I, it, it, I, it's not just one thing. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's a, co a continuous thing for me. Mm -hmm. It, it goes a little bit back to, you know, my insistence on having listening be such a critical part of my leadership approach. So mm -hmm. you're constantly listening. You're constantly getting feedback. And sometimes you're getting feedback about your vision mm -hmm. and about your priorities and, you know, how you're spending your time. But sometimes you're getting feedback about what you're doing well and mm -hmm. what you need to do better. Yes. And so, you know, I'm constantly getting feedback and things <laughs> about, you know, I, I'm constantly getting advice and I get a lot of good advice. Mm -hmm. And so I would just tell you that, that that's an ongoing thing for me and always will be. All right. Wonderful. So as a president, I can imagine, you know, I can imagine how busy you are. Do you have a hobby? <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, my, my hobby, uh, in some ways for my wife and I, sincerely, it's been our kids. Mm -hmm. You know, we've invested in our kids. Uh, now they're all kind of out of high school and they're going into college and they're getting older and, and you still invest in them, but in different ways. And so, but I would tell you that, you know, family has been pri priority number one for us. And so now it's this different new chapter as they're getting older. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, we've kind of moved away from them. And, and in some ways, I would tell you, our hobby has been investing time and energy in the students here, mm -hmm. which has been a lot of fun. I know, I know, I know more about the different clubs here and the different activities. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, beyond that, it's probably a little bit of golf and maybe a little bit of fishing and <laughs> hunting, maybe something like that. But uh, I haven't had a whole lot of time to do those things yet, but I'm yeah. looking forward to it when I have a, a day off sometime soon. Wonderful, wonderful. As you know, this show is... Um it's about uh, young professionals. It's to give them, you know, ideas and advice on how to navigate their own careers. Now that we are the last few minutes of uh, the show, of the show, what advice do you have for young professionals who are maybe watching the show or who may be wa watching this online? Yeah, mm -hmm. I, you know, there's kind of two things I tell all of our freshmen coming in, and mm -hmm. when I talk to various student groups, and I, you know, number one is ask for help. Mm -hmm. You know, going back to myself being a first generation college student, uh, I bumbled through college uh, and for a lot of reasons I bumbled through. It was hard for me. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the things I didn't do well was ask for help. And had I asked for help, uh, would have probably helped the bumbling, you know, mm -hmm. uh, quite a bit. And so we have amazing people here who want to help. We have amazing resources uh, that want, you know, the, that are there for our students. And I, I think the same as when you're, you know, graduating from college, going out into the uh, to the real world, so to speak. There are going to be mentors out there. There are going to be resources, but you got to ask for help. Yeah. And so that's not easy for everybody. It's certainly not easy for me. So uh, that's certainly one of the things I, I always encourage uh, students to do. And the other one I would tell you is to get involved, mm -hmm. you know, get out of your comfort zone a little bit. Uh, try something new. You know, so at NDSU, we have hundreds of clubs. Mm -hmm. Try one. Mm 
yes. that are doing great things. It's a great way to get connected, to make friends, uh, to test your limits a little bit. And so it's easy to sit back, sit in your dorm room mm -hmm. or to just go and do the things that you've always done. But, you know, part of college is about, you know, growth, personal growth, professional growth. And mm -hmm. it's a great time to do amazing things uh, inside the classroom. But the learning and the experience and the journey is as much about outside the classroom. And so I encourage students to, you know, try something new. Yeah. And, you know, when it's time to go be that professional, I'd give them the same advice. So, mm -hmm. you know, the journey is, it's a lifetime one. And so just keep challenging yourself to try new things. Mr. President, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you, sir. It's you do a pleasure. great job. I enjoyed it. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you. It's a pleasure to have you here. So, and the advice, I'm fake. I'm going to use this advice myself. Oh, good. There you go. I appreciate <laughs> so it. That, uh, and then also share it with other young professionals that I meet along the way. So thank you again for being on the show. Thank you. Now, this is the part that I tell you. It's up to you to make today a great day. Have a great day.